Ladies and gentlemen, very, very good evening to you, for all of you coming in on a nice chilly afternoon and evening. We are honored to have Professor Anindya Roy. Truly a privilege to have someone of his intellect, erudition, and his articulation. I first met Professor Roy several years ago during the COVID years when he was uh, one of our guest distinguished speakers and thanks to Professor Anuradha Chatterjee who invited him and this was for Loreto for Professor Ratna Chatterjee's memorial. So in the last two years we've been talking a little bit and then uh, I've been looking up on his scholarly work, most impressive, the way he brings the colonial and the post-colonial on the same page. Um, today's a special day in many ways. I woke up, I was woken up at five in the morning with a call about a friend's father who passed away. And the geographical parameters that Edward Lear in his book, which we're going to be talking about, the Viceroy's artist, was shared by the gentleman who passed away in the early hours of this morning, Dr. Chatterjee, who was a part of the Indian Economic Service. And he served in the same areas 50 years ago. So I'm recalling him and his memory. I'm also recalling Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose today, not just because it's his birthday, but because there is a connection with Leah. He, uh, in many ways, was very fond of nonsense first, and his connection to women's empowerment with the INA, the Indian National Army in Singapore. And I'm happy to say today we have Loki, uh, who is here, a friend of mine from uh, Singapore, and she's very happy to be here to hear Professor Anindya Roy's talk. Professor Anindya Roy actually, in some ways, is an unusual academic. The compassion and the wisdom that he brings has not just to do with the red part R.E.A.D. of what we do as academics, the teaching, the reading, pu publishing, and the writing. But as Professor Emeritus, and I'll get to all that he's done before this stage in his life in a second, I would like to acknowledge that he's trying now to spend more time in the same spaces as people such as Edward Lear had done in few years of their lives in their visit to India by improving the lot of those who will be bettered in their experience of being educated in Kalimpong. And you have a school there that you're assisting. Yeah. Okay, so to give you a part of the Monty of what Professor Anandyo Roy is about, I will take a few minutes and I think all of that, all of the people who are here today are here because they have a connection with Professor Roy. So I beg your indulgence for a few seconds to see how his life and his work are connected to someone like Edward Lear. Professor Anindya Roy went to St. Paul's the school, a Catholic missionary school, which was about 35 kilometers from Rurkela. Then Delhi University, and I think it was University of Texas at Austin. And then you went to, yes, at, uh, yes, at Southern Methodist, 
University uh, in Dallas, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Dallas, Texas, and then he was grabbed by Colby College and his contributions are well recorded there on critical theory, history, and literature. He did uh, teach courses, 19th century and early 20th century on E.M. Foster, on fictions of empire and women writers of the global south. But what interests us, I think, on the compassionate side and on the human interest side of a man like Professor Roy is that he was raised in a small mining town near Rurkela, where the mines are run were run by Bird and Company. Many of you will remember that company. His father was the chief medical officer in charge of setting up the healthcare system for women miners. He was instrumental, his father was, that is, instrumental in setting up daycare centers for women miners, for which he had to train a staff of indigenous Adivasi women. Not an easy job. The trainers were Anglo-Indian nurses, and he brought help to women minors and their children, and opportunities which they would not have otherwise got. And I think this idea of service stayed with him in many ways. If you see what he is doing now, uh, which is actually putting his money where his mouth is, and facilitating education in Kalampong. In uh, his afterward, he says, the more I followed Leah's itinerary of travel, the more I was able to explore Leah's world of memory and desire. He invokes Virginia Woolf and Mrs. Dalloway in his afterward. And I think it touches many of us scholars because we know that by examining the silences, the ellipses, the lapses, and what goes on between the lines, and under all that nonsensical verse, the pain of being isolated, the pain of poverty, was what Edward Lear had within him very deeply entrenched. So before we go on to the rest of the evening, I think it might be a good idea if you got the trajectory of what we will try to do. I will first invite Professor Roy to say why, what, and where about this book, The Viceroy's Artist. And then we will go on to a Q&A, which I will try and pin him down on a few things which he might want to unveil for us. And then we will open it up to the floor and to our hybrid friends who are watching. So without further ado, um, Professor Roy, please take the floor. Good evening, friends. Okay. Uh, thank you, Julie, uh, for that very warm introduction. Um, I must thank Bengal Club for giving me this opportunity to present my work. I would like to begin by saying that I am not a writer, I write. Uh, and I write out of an impulse to explore, out of an impulse to transform, and out of an impulse to get others interested in the world. Uh, and Leo provided me with a wonderful opportunity to do that. Um, I discovered Leo by chance, almost you know, 
through some kind of serendipity, uh, I was exploring some documents at the British Library on travel in the 19th century. And I found in front of me, piled on top of, of all the books I'd ordered, a book that I hadn't ordered, which was Edward Lear's Indian Journals. For those of you uh, who know the British Library, uh, they turned to electronic keyword search methods around the time when I was doing my research. So clearly that book fell within the rubric of the keyword search that I put in. And so he, there it was. Um, I had known Edward Lear because I am a scholar of the 19th century. And ever since I was a child, I was familiar with Lear through Shukumar Rai's Abul Tabul. Uh, I grew up uh, in part of India where Bangla wasn't taught. So my mother introduced me to the reading of Bangla through Abul Tabul. And that's how I got to Lear. Interesting. And of course, we memorized Lear. But when I first encountered the journals of Edward Lear, I was a bit surprised because I had heard that he had been to India, that he had spent nearly 14 or 15 months in India. And I had read about his travels in uh, some of his biographies. But I didn't know that he had left behind him 260 odd pages of journals. So uh, what I found at the British Library, of course, was the first printed version of the journals. Um, what also surprised me was that although he had spent 14 months traveling through India, the biography, biographies of Lear provided very little information about his travels. I think in uh, uh, Jenny Ugler's book, there's just, there's just one paragraph devoted to his India sojourns. So anyway, when I read it, I was curious. I didn't know what to do with it, but I kept it away. I wrote a few notes. It was much later that I discovered that the manuscripts of those journals, the original written journals were at Harvard, at the <clears throat> Hooten Library Center. And of course, I taught at Colby, which was barely you know, a two hour drive from there. So I found myself at the Hooten Library looking at the original journals, the handwritten journals of Edward Lear. And I think when I first saw it and I actually picked it up, I almost felt I, as if I had a living specimen in my hand. There was something about looking at those journals, seeing all the lines crossed out, uh, seeing the, the papers, the edges of the, of the pages frayed and breaking, also seeing some of his doodle work along the way because he was also an artist, right? Uh, somehow made me feel that there was a story in that particular journal that needed to be told. My first impulse, of course, the first thing that came to mind of, that I would write a scholarly piece. There were certain passages in it that somehow provoked me to thinking, you know, this is, uh, this would be good to frame in a theoretical historical way to present an argument about a colonial artist trying to get the landscape of India that eluded his grasp. But as I was writing, somehow I lost interest and I forgot about it. Till January 2020, I was back in Kalimpong, wandering and looking at the Kanchenjunga rise above the clouds, you know, the shimmering slopes and the color and all of that. And this was the time when I was with my students from Colby because I designed and set up a Himalaya program for my college where I taught, where I bought about 15 to 20 students every January to explore the Himalayas. So that year, because I had announced to Colby that I was going to leave, I was going to quit teaching, uh, the institution asked me if I could have someone shadow me 
you know, to explore whether it would be possible for someone else to pick up the program and keep it running. So there was Sarah Bronstein, who is a fiction writer, an American fiction writer, who also taught fiction at Colby College in the Department of Creative Writing. She was the one shadowing me. So I expressed to her, you know, there's a strange conjunction between seeing the Kanchenjunga rise and thinking about those journals. She got interested and she asked me to show her the PDFs of the journals. And she came back to me, she read it, she said, you know, this calls for retelling. Don't try and do anything scholarly with it now. You know, to retell it. Historical fiction is a growing genre. And I looked at her face and I said, but I've ne never written fiction. I write about fiction. I don't write fiction. And, you know, those two things involve two very different activities of the brain. One is much more analytical, the other is more, more creative, where you have leaps and all of that, and much more motive. Um, of course, at the heart of both is a feel for language. You have to understand how language works. So anyway, I went ahead and did a lot of research, thinking I would eventually produce a scholarly article, and I never did. Instead, during the lockdown, I started writing. And I don't know what came over me. I would get up in the morning, I'd been thinking about Edward Lear. I'd just finished reading his second biography, the more recent one. And I just started writing. And there was the original journals. And there was me spinning this. And the way I spun it was uh, thinking, what would it have been for someone like me to have shadowed him, looked over his shoulder, seen the same sights, experienced the same kinds of things. He traveled quite a bit. He was commissioned, of course, to do uh, a painting of the Kanchenjunga by the then Viceroy, Lord Northbrook, Thomas Baring. So that is where it all started. I wrote the draft. I just dashed it out. I sent it off to many of my friends who write fiction. And they said, well, this is really interesting. You need to work a little bit on this, a little bit on that. So there I was, you know, revising, modulating, altering throwing out entire chunks of stuff that I felt I'd written at that time, but somehow didn't fit into what I was doing, which is writing historical fiction. Brilliant. And that's the story. Brilliant. And you know, that brings me to the next question, which is, um, you have woven together uh, so seamlessly, right at the start, his childhood. And I think, uh, I do believe in, in the psychoanalytical theory of how important childhood is. And for many of us who would know, uh, his father went to debtor's prison. So it was a story of poverty, of challenges, of many kinds. So the family was in, in a way split up because his older sister, Anne, took him and started a home where they could sort of live together. But he asks, I think, and, and you have brought this so much to the fore when you say that what was really his home, he wondered. And Anne and he moved out. The father was in prison. And there was no real home where you could smell the smell of Sunday stew or even see a cat on the rare window sill. I think the journeys that you talk about that happened throughout his life, at every point he wondered what it was to have a home. And I think this sort of gently moved into his life where he sought, as you say, so poignantly, a life partner uh, and friendship. And he wanted to marry and have a family, which never really happened. So um, my question to you is, the beginning of the book, I feel, is extremely strong. And it grabs the reader. And that is the most difficult part, I think, of writing a novel because you tend to get distracted. Yeah. So how, how did you figure out that 
this you had so much information and you you know you had the archives you had the journal you had so much stuff and you realize that even in the beginning when we read your uh, first few pages of um, the viceroy's artist it it was not a lack of trying uh, that didn't get him the kind of wages or a position because he was an extremely gifted artist from age 16, yeah. right? Yeah. So would you like to tell us a little bit about how you <clears throat> arranged the material? Yeah. Well, I started... It was almost six weeks after he had arrived in India, made his way all the way from Bombay through the heart of India into Calcutta, the seat of the empire, he spent two weeks in Calcutta and then made his way up to the Kanchenjaka. But I decided to begin to open the story with the story of Kanchenjanga for two reasons. Number one, he was obviously commissioned to do a painting. And that's where he sits and mulls over the landscape and wonders if it'd ever be able to produce a painting out of a landscape that's always so changing. There are no boundaries, there are no lines. How do you even do a sketch of that landscape? That's the first reason. The second reason is also because I have been inhabiting those spaces so much. So then my own experience filtered through in an almost capillary way into the figure of Lear. And what I picked up from the journals is difficulty sitting there wondering what to do with this landscape also comes from my own experience of inhabiting that world. So there are the two reasons for that. So uh, uh, Leo was 62 years of age. He was arthritic. He suffered from epileptic fits and heart condition, arthritic, and his left foot was shorter than his right. So we're talking about a man who was very frail. And he undertook this journey at the age of 62 in 1873. Of course, he was accompanied by a manservant. But I think something about that fascinated me. I said, how much courage you would need to, be, to muster up, you know, the energy to travel so much on pony carts, on hand-carried carts, on trains, uh, to be able to do something like this. Of course, he's, he was, he always wanted to visit India, but obviously couldn't afford it till he received the commission. It was the commission that allowed him to come to India, right? So I was really, in a way, fascinated by that, by that energy. And as I found myself walking up and down the Himalayas, running out of breath, and I was not even 60 at that point, I realized how did this man do it in 1873? There was that part of it. Um, Anandhu, could you tell us a little bit about what I found fascinating is I remember, and I was just talking to uh, Professor Moitro here and to Anasiva, um, many years ago, I must have been in my teens, um, either at the Tate or at the National Gallery in, in London, there was a showing of his sketches. And I never understood. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And before I read this, yeah. And Leah was never in, uh, was never a frontispiece for me because I'm a post-colonial scholar. Yeah, but even you? then, uh, the nonsense verse is yeah. amazing. Yeah. But the point I would uh, like to share with the audience and ask you to comment on is some of those uh, framed, the, what would they, what would you call them? The, the washes. The washes. Yeah, brown ink and yes. charcoal, pencil yes. and charcoal, cool. and just a little bit of water. And he, washes. Yes. And he would have a little annotation. Yeah. I, I wish I was smart enough to know how important that was, <laughs> but I didn't. And I missed yeah. so much of it. Yeah. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about that and how you would connect it to what I again find uh, singularly expressive of you to have picked up all the descriptions of the Kanchenjunga when he's painting the Kanchenjunga he is thinking of Mount Etna, Etna and other mountains he's been to 
and there's always a connect always a connect with the past yeah. so that continuous back and forth which we think is a hoo-ha for postmodernism, was very much in Lear yeah. nearly 200 years ago yeah. so yeah. Yeah. I would like you yeah. very much to tell us about this, this right. constant um you know his control yeah. of this past you know, when I first decided to write this as fiction, the biggest challenge is, was for me, uh, how do I weave this narrative? Should it be a linear narrative? Because it's our, after all a journey, right? A journey, there is a beginning, there's a middle and an end. But something inside me, because I'd done all of us, read some of his diaries, I knew about his difficult childhood, and there were spaces in the journals where he seemed to pause and not say anything that unsaid provoked me to think that he was stopping because he was remembering something. You know, very often it's those empty spaces that allow you to think about narrative. So then I decided to chart another journey with it, with his, his journey into his past. And I couldn't do it by using things like he remembered or he recalled. And I said, then how do I do it? How do I weave the present journey with the past memory? Of course, Virginia Woolf came to my rescue. Having taught Woolf for many years, having been a big fan of Virginia Woolf, often considered to be a very difficult writer, but for me, the best writer they can ever be. Uh, I said, here is Virginia Woolf. So she literally led me by the hand and I said, okay, this is how you do it. So free indirect discourse, you move in and out, in and out, a kind of stream of consciousness. Although there is a guiding consciousness that leads you into and then out of the consciousness to look at the person from outside. So that's the kind of braiding that I did with the past and the present. And that is where the childhood becomes important. You know, as an adult, he dealt with loneliness because he moved, constantly kept moving. He traveled through the Balkans, Albania, you know, uh, the Holy Land, Egypt, Italy, France, but he really didn't have a home as such. He left England when he was quite young and he kind of moved around and eventually settled, of course, in Italy, where his grave is in San Remo. And so this you know, quest for a home remained a real thing for him. And I thought I could use that as a kind of a device to connect. You know, he, he's after all a stranger in India. So the feeling of being the outsider, of being a stranger, not knowing the world, I think resonated for him because this is something that he had experienced, you know, in his own life. And that is what I also thought of braiding through these two journeys, the external journey and the internal journey of dreams and memories. Well, on a close reading, I would love you to read for us page 32 and 33, where you talk about his uh, sliding in and out. And it is so seamlessly done. It's a pleasure to read how many of our writers today are constantly trying to do that break the paradigms and the geographies. Yes, please, yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, they're walking. And you know, walking is not an, is not an, not an easy task when you're up in the Himalayas. And he is in Kershyong at this point. This is where he first, he gets his first big glimpse of the Kanchenjang, and this is where he starts sketching. So uh, this is page 32. So Lear hears Georgi. Georgi is the manservant. Lear hears Georgi say something about losing the sun and not dallying anymore. He's waiting at the curve of the road. No more tarrying. They begin walking together, but soon Georgi is ahead by more than 20 feet. Lear certainly has very little breath left. The road narrows into a dark, muddy lane, but in less than a few minutes, he, it curves sharply to the right and leads into an unevenly cobbled road. 
magically illuminated by a sharp ray of sunlight streaming down from above. The road seems to have been paved in pure gold. They're both glad to leave the stretch of impenetrable dark dampness behind them. The few rundown wooden houses give way to a stone wall that runs for half a mile along the left side of the shining road. From behind the wooden gate in the wall, a tall Tibetan man appears quite suddenly. He's holding a prayer wheel, a cylindrical metal object with tiny seashells attached to the rim and mounted on a metal shaft. Lear chuckles at the man's brightly colored boots that are stitched out of layers of bright silk fur and hay. The gentle tinkling of the prayer wheel has echoes of another world. The Prince Phantasmion of Palmland. Phantasmion dare, dare tarry no longer. He used his wings vigorously. Potentilla, the fairy god of insects, is Phantasmion's protector. Ulanda, Pensilimar, Valhogra, Feldin, Ula, Anne's voice fills the air as she reads slowly from Sarah Coleridge's tale and then trails into a soft whisper. Placing his prayer wheel on top of the wall, the man bends down to pat the head of a shaggy dog that lies curled beside the road. Standing on the other side, a little boy in a red and blue cap stares at Lear. On his arms hang strips of flowery fabric that he holds up as soon as he realizes that he has caught the, the corpulent man's attention. He's selling brightly colored aprons with lace frills attached to the ends. Should I continue? One more paragraph. Okay. The fingers slowly press down the white and gray chalk an autumn excursion to the Lake District, to Crummock, Buttermere, and Lowe's Water. The fat woman in a frilled yellow and blue apron sits very still under the white light filtering through the trees, stippling the quiet surface of Crummock. Next to her is a brown terrier wearing a red and blue collar. Brilliant. So the connection between Crummock and Kalampong. Worlds apart. How does he do it? So these are the, some of the ways mm. I try and establish these connections between the past and the present through color, for example. Many of them are sensory details. Many of them are sensory details of color. And there are also sounds as well. Seven. Wow. Okay. The shattering of glass. Well, they're walking, and of course, they see two women selling these very exotic looking fruits. They hardly look like fruits. Georgi places the bunch back in the basket. The fantastic fruits sold by the goblin merchants. Leo exclaims under his breath, picking up the bunch again and running his fingers slowly over the taut skin. Upland Market, that startlingly odd poem about the pretty sweet-toothed Laura who traded her golden curls for these ripe cherries. The goblins, the goblins, come by, come by. What did Miss Rossetti have in mind? Leah continues to mutter under his breath while the woman with the diadem smiles at him. Fruit not for eating, medicine, poison. The woman takes the bunch of berries from Leah's fingers and puts them away in another basket. Lear is startled and the silence swells between them. He senses her slow exultation as the breeze lifts the ends of the shawl draped over her shoulder. An old man swoops down to pick a few of the remaining berries from the basket. A cat's 
face, a whisk tail, one tramped at a rat's pace, one crawled like a snail. There is no going back. Once she gorges on them, she craves for more and eventually wastes away. Yorgi is not surprised by his master's mutterings, having caught him uttering on more than one occasion poetic lines interspersed with words drawn from some magic formula found in old scrolls. This is from Goblin Market. For those of you who don't know Goblin Market, it's a remarkable poem by Christina Rossetti. The shattered class, of course, uh, is a metaphor here. It connects us back. If you read the book carefully to the beginning of the book, where they are so poor that when a window shatters in the house, uh, the, they don't have money to put a new window there or a new glass pane. But to stop the draft coming in in England in winter, they stuff it with some old clothes. Um, moving on to another uh, skill that you have very uh, adroitly, I would say, employed is the cameo appearances of people such as Tennyson, such as Lockwood, Kipling, our own Kipling's father, who was uh, the head of the JJ School of Arts. So did you actually find these in your archival material or did you have to dig a little and put your own? The two kind of uh, figures that I animate through my fiction, unnamed figures, uh, for example, he meets a member of the Bengal sappers in Darjeeling. And all he mentions is that uh, he was quite irritated by the presence of a man boasting the triumphs of empire. Uh, what I've done is I've fleshed him out completely. And it's obviously through satire. Uh, then there are other figures uh, that are shadowy figures in the journal that I have fleshed out. Um, what about Queen Victoria? Queen Victoria. Now, Queen Victoria appears because Edward Lear was a tutor of Queen Victoria, but for two weeks. Uh, Queen Victoria couldn't really develop her artistic skills, uh, and, and Lear discovered that, I think, by day three. Uh, but, you know, since he was employed by the Queen, he remained for two weeks. So I have Queen Victoria appear also in these little vignettes and memories. Similarly, Tennyson, Tennyson was a very close friend of Edward Lear. Edward Lear wasn't a rich man, but because he was so talented, people were attracted to him. And members of the gentry, Lord Derby, for example, you know, Tennyson, Holman Hunt, the poet, all of the, even Rossetti, the painter, knew him quite well. So he somehow managed to make his way up through. Um, so R R Tennyson was a very good friend. So Tennyson appears, and of course he meets uh, Kipling's father, Lockwood Kipling, uh, in Bombay, and it's a scene where I elaborate uh, quite a bit on his interactions with uh, a, a very well-known colonial figure uh, in uh, in the nineteenth century. Yeah. Um a word about your, uh, you know, your very descriptive passages, which uh, my book club members pointed out to me right in the beginning. They read your book before I'd finished it. So, and they enjoyed it. And they said, it's a totally different kind of book. Um, and I'll just, if I may just share with our audience, uh, I don't have the page number here, but tell us how you thought of this. I read and felt, uh, mountain ranges which you talk about transform themselves to a ribbon of crumpled satin you know it is these very uh eclectic uh very very different kind of ways in which to configure 
how to describe something, which makes it a very special read. Yeah, that's my imagination at work. Yeah. I think as a writer, you test these things out through visual memory, but also from your readings. You know, if you've been a teacher of literature for so many years, yes. these images enter your consciousness, take on new forms, and almost like crumpled satin, resonate, you know, shine in different ways in, in memory. So definitely that was something that I, yeah, I picked up. There wasn't, uh, the passages in the journals, uh, there is a lot of description, but there's a description of difficulty, not getting the middle ground. And for someone, you know, an artist trained in the Western tradition. Very frustrating. If you don't have the middle ground, you cannot do a painting. And so, and that is what I found really fascinating. He really agonizes over it. And even when he's describing the landscape, he'll go back to the fact that there is nothing but emptiness in the middle. His um, talent in portraying almost palpably the spirit of parrots uh, so in some ways, in his mind, he was an ornithologist, he, you know, and he knew so much about animals and birds and he worked with the zoo uh, yes. in England, right? Yeah. His love of uh, botany, you know, botanical drawings, which was very uh, much the scene if we look at the tracts I don't know if you remember David mm -hmm. Malouf from, yes, absolutely. you know, and remembering Abs Babylon. Babylon, Babylon. Exactly. So uh, what was it about uh, the 19th century writer or, uh, you know, the painter or the artist that made them so, uh, you know, invested in their uh, unpackaging of empire, of new colonies? Yeah. Well, Edward Lear knew Charles Darwin, right? Uh, not, they were not close friends, but they were part of the circle. And Charles Darwin, of course, in many ways, uh, gave rise to an entire new way of cataloging the world. You know, the first was Linnaeus, of course, but Linnaeus was more focused on botanicals, the French Linnaean in the 18th century. In the 19th century, it came down to pretty much cataloging and recording all the species. But I think something about Lear's weird imagination made him also develop something called nonsense botany. And like Shukumar Rai, years later, he created animals that were combined out of different species. And this was the site to him that I found fascinating because he earned his living by drawing botanicals because he didn't have any financial support. But at some point he developed, I think, the ability to turn things in a way, invert things, blur the boundaries. And that is, I think, what makes him such an intriguing 19th century figure in his paintings and drawings, and of course, in his limericks. He was not a serious poet. He never attempted to write serious poetry. Uh, but whatever he did through poetical compositions are all nonsense forms. There was something about nonsense that resonated for him and that others found so attractive. Yes, and I think uh, a, a point of, you know, would, which would add to this uh, discussion at this point would be that he was also a known musician. Yeah. Right, yes. so the the audial version yeah. of nonsense poetry is so attractive. Absolutely, the limerick. The limerick, and he yeah. almost got it pat. You know, yeah. uh, the number of syllables that that there yeah. should be, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And the longer nonsense verses, like the Kamarban example. Would you like to read us something or recite something? <laughs> There's someone here whose favorite poem is the Kamarban, and uh, Deepika is somewhere there, and. Uh, Deepika, would you like to read the Kamarband for us if I gave you the book? How wonderful, please. Because she has the right dramatic voice and enunciation. Come, come, to come Deepika, that. come. Come and read it. I've heard her, and it's really resonant. Her voice 
It's always been a signature voice. Come, come. Oh dear. Childhood. Yes. All right. So maybe we, yeah, please. The Kamarband is uh, okay. So of course, the Kamarband in your book stands for something else, also. It also, right? yeah, yes. yeah, okay. it does. It you, does. You... Yeah. Let me. Why have, you, why have you sprung this on? That's because I heard you enunciate the first passage of the Kamarband, and it was amazing. Okay, now. Uh, if I can find the camera, but it's there, it's not Edward here. You know, it's, it's the nonsense. Why am I just? As you can see, I carry this as a little Bible. Yeah. She said to watch the evening star. I'm sorry. I'm I'm really sorry. I'm going to, oh, here is the camera. There we go. She sat upon her doby to watch the evening star, and all the punkas as they passed cried, My, how fair you are. Around her bow with quivering leaves the tall Kamsamas grew, and Kitwood girls in wild festoons hung down from Choki's blue. Below her home, the river rolled with soft, melubious sound, where golden finned chaprasses swam in myriads circling round. Above, on tallest trees remote, green ayahs perched alone. And all night long, the mosaic moaned its melancholy tone. And where the purple nullas threw their branches far and wide, and silvery gariwalas flew in silence, side by side, the little beastie's twistling cry rose on the flagrant air, and oft the angry jampan howled deep in his hateful lair. She sat upon her doby, she heard the nama come, when all at once a cry arose, the kamerband is come. In vain she fled, with open jaws the angry monster followed, and so, before assistance came, that lady fair was swallowed. <laughs> They sought in vain for even a bone respectfully to bury. They said, oh, hers was a dreadful fate. And Echo answered, very. <laughs> they nailed her doby to the wall where last her form was seen. And underneath, they wrote these words in yellow, blue, and green. Beware, ye fair, ye fair, beware. Nor sit out late at night lest horrid cummerbunds should come and swallow you outright. Thank you. <laughs> so Leah has his own music. Cummerbund. Cummerbund becomes a figure, a monster, a fear of a nightmare. Yes. Um, so would you would you like to tell us a little about the food imagery that you have? Not too many, but I think it's fascinating because the, in, within the first few pages, I found the boiled tongue and broccoli, which was overdone, which reminds me of a certain Dr. Mehta here who always comments on the broccoli, which is not quite right. It's too well done. So will you yeah. tell us a little bit about how, and yeah. then there's a, a place where the caste system is so well described. It found a representation in the tongue and the cook had to, no, the manager of this duck bungalow had to actually guarantee that the, the cook, that this tongue is not from a cow, it's from an ox. So we don't know what the difference would make, but it did make a difference. But he also suffered. You know, uh, he suffered from, he had terrible indigestion. And uh, don't forget he was traveling on trains. He hated cumin. Hated cumin, uh, but would look forward to food eating. 
and he would arrive at these dark bungalows and look at the menu, say, what's been listed on the handwritten menus, right? So this is here in Kershiong, he's arrived at uh, the dark bungalow, and I'm reading from uh, page six, right? In less than an hour, Edward Lear finds himself sitting in a room filled with the smell of burning pine needles. He tries to shake off that lingering sleepiness by drinking his third cup of tea. It is breakfast time at Weathercock Point's Duck Bungalow. Dipro, tongue for you, sir, the cook utters under his breath, placing the plate of boiled tongue and broccoli on the table. The sahibs will eat anything, the cook thinks seeing Lear's look of delight at the piece of shriveled dark meat lying on the plate. I'm beginning to get weary of curries, he had told Georgi the day before they took their leave of the caretaker at Pankhabari Dark Panglo, who had very proudly served up his spicy curry swirling in oily fried onions and cumin. The recurring indigestion that he had had, that he had had to deal with in the nearly five weeks of travel through India made him think of returning to his old favorites. And so that morning, as he took his seat at the table, he was delighted to see the word tongue scribbled in bold on the handwritten menu. And the overcooked broccoli served next to the tongue does not look very appetizing, but Lear is glad that a large bottle of sherry and a smaller bottle of what the manager calls local wine stands next to the plate. Skins, and, and that's where, this is the first instance. And there are many other instances of him thinking about food as he travels. You also have picked up on cartography, you know, the idea of empire being charted, the idea of how that macrocosm is reflected in the microcosm of, for example, Hooker, uh, a friend of his, with a map, Kabru, Rathong, Krokatang. So the words sounded like a description from fantasy land. Um, what do you think the maps do in your book? This is the first instance, I think, where Lear remembers visiting his friend Joseph Hooker, who was a very well-known botanist who came to Darjeeling in the 1840s. And Hooker was famous because not only was he a botanist traveling through Darjeeling hills, looking for rare orchids, and other plants, he, was, he also strayed into Sikkim without permit and was arrested and imprisoned. And the governor general had to send a special request to have him released. So Joseph Hooker is Edward Lear's friend. So when he comes to India, Joseph Hooker sends some letters through him. And in one of his letters, he mentions meeting Hooker before his India travel. Just as a mention. So what I did was dramatize the meeting. Said, how would the meeting have been between Hooker and Edward Lear, who had never been to India, but was going to, and, and, and Hooker, who had such a, an interesting life, you know, uh, suspect of being a spy. But anyway, so in one of the scenes, uh, Hooker takes out a huge map of the Himalayas the northern fringes of the empire. And then he puts his finger on all of the peaks and enunciates the names. And Lear just hears those sounds, but to him, they sound like, again, you know, the sounds that he had invented, the words that he had invented, or the, the words that he encountered in the poetry of Sarah Coleridge and others too. So there was that kind of familiarity. So this is the first instance of maps. And then much later, when he's in Hyderabad, uh, uh, you know, he actually witnesses a darbar, the Nizam's darbar there. And he, 
I think the sections in his journals, he elaborates quite a bit on what he saw there. So I didn't have to really exercise my imagination a lot. All I did was dramatize those scenes a little bit. But there is, again, it's a vassal state. The Nizam is under the British. Everything, including the railways that the Nizam owns, has been sanctioned by the British. So he's also thinking about what kind of a world is this? As he, because he you know, doesn't realize that the empire has just so many layers to it. There's administrative, there's educational, there is also all these tra treaties signed by vassal states. Uh, and, and he kind of thinks all of this is really nonsensical in many ways, right? So he goes into cartography there as well, yes. So you're the author of Civility and Empire, Rutledge, 2004, and, and you know, it's no surprise to many of us to find that you chose Leah, compassionate, graceful, and certainly has shown us that there is enough civility in him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I found his weirdness to be more attractive, really. It's the weirdness that moved me, and, and a weirdness to find in an age that believed in a certain kind of order and decorum. Formalism. And for, in a maintaining the exterior, you know, forms of civility. He is actually, in many ways, goes against the grains of civility, but he has compassion. So, again, a figure that inspires through all of these contradictions. Uh, that allowed me to really uh, use him as the central figure, the protagonist of this book. Is there... Okay. Yes, indeed. I would just like to read a little section towards the end. Lear has been agonizing about how he will ever produce an oil painting that was going to be nine foot by four foot. That's a large oil painting for someone who hasn't been doing a lot of oil painting because painting in oil required a lot of money. Unless you were commissioned, you couldn't do it. And you know, someone special, someone like Leo. So what I did was throughout he agonizes, but at some point I had to give him a vision. He's been dreaming, he's been churning up all of these memories. I had to give him a vision whereby he can see what he will produce. The painting isn't done three years after he returns to Italy. But this is where I have him see this image of Kanchanjanga as a painted image, not as a space where there is only emptiness, but a new kind of detail comes in. And this is where this is where I felt uh, that there is some trace of magical realism. Yeah. Uh, so, oh yeah, of course the mic. Let me see if I get the page first. It's towards the end. Uh, okay, is it page 11, is it? Uh, page two. One, one. Uh, oh no, the fall, yeah, yeah. It is on the final vision of Baldwin. Okay, so this is 259. He is uh, in Tutikorin. He's waiting to catch a ship that will take him to Ceylon. And uh, he's thinking about uh, his path, well, immediate past, you know, the travel through India. The night before they reached Tutikoran Harbor, he had lain in his bed restless. It had been a long day of packing and travel. The call of an unknown bird had woken him just when the early light entered the room. At first, all he could sense was an impenetrable darkness, a blankness of sorts. It was as if his mind had emptied itself of all forms, all shapes, all colors, even sounds. From the half darkness, he saw a shape. The Leviathan surged out of the ocean, awash with colors that he could not recall that he could not recall ever seeing that wintry day in Kershyong as he sat among the ferns. The glacial whiteness 
accentuated the sharpness of the icy slopes that seemed to plunge into a haze of blue and white. Instead of the blankness in the middle, there was here a shimmering haze. A heaving up in front was a swathe of brown, green, red, and turquoise poised over a dark gorge where the black had cleaved down to disappear into the bottom where the edge of a picture frame appeared. On the flat brown surface of ground in the mid foreground was a cluster of human figures. A hooded figure was bent towards another whose arms were partly covered in gleaming white sleeves. A necklace sparkled on the throat of another figure. Although dwarfed by the enormity of the peak, each human figure in this cluster seemed to stand out as if caught up in mid-conversation, frozen in time and gesture. Was this the Kanchenjunga that had lain buried in his mind all along? A likeness to something that was yet to take real shape? A giant wave crashes on the shore. And in your, I'll, I'll take your permission to open it up to the floor. Uh, and if I might impose and ask Anasuya uh, to go first from our book club, avid reader, very insightful. Would you like to come up, Anasuya? Congratulations, Anindav. I still remember the day at our Udita club when you told me that the cover for the book <laughs> was ready and I was so excited and looking forward to this day. Yeah, my nephew. Yes, I was there when you were telling me about it. Yeah. So yes, the book has been a very interesting read and um, through the reading of it, uh, I would like your comments actually on uh, perhaps the way in which you uh, described Anindur, uh, sorry, uh, Edward Lear's uh, difficulty in seeing. For an artist, he had very uh, impaired uh, vision. And uh, through your book, whether it is your fictional, fictionalization of his uh, journals or whether that was a fact that he had incorporated in it, uh, he would do a particular uh, pressure on his eyes to see a little clearly as a child, as a child and uh, and along with uh, recording what he was watching there's a lot of description of the sounds in the environment so together it gives the impression of a, an overcompensation of the other senses when you're trying to uh, understand your environment so was that part of his uh, persona or his characteristic some of the details I found in his biography was that he suffered from not only myopia, but also severe astigmatism. And for an artist, uh, when what, what you see is how you represent it through art, when that becomes limited, you develop an internal sense. Yes. And I think what he starts doing is that out of the fuzziness, he begins to kind of forge shapes, but he needs other senses also. And the sound becomes important. Very important. As he's staring at the Kanchenjunga, all of a sudden he sees the blankness, then he hears the cowbell tinkle. Then suddenly he hears the wind run down the ferns. So I think all of these sensory details were important. And even as a child, for example, because he had difficulty seeing he would before uh, he would take off his glasses and press the top mm -hmm. of his eyelids i don't know for many of you who've had myopia you can do that mm -hmm. you take off your glasses and you press a certain part of your eye am i right and the world comes into view but temporarily and you release the pressure and it goes back into its blurriness and for him that was a discovery don't forget, if I might again jump in here, both of you, mm -hmm. he was a very depressed human being at times. Yeah. And I mean, who was surprised if you've just so many 
challenges and battles. Um, amazing how he managed. I think uh, there's also a lot of um, oblique references to his loneliness on account of his uh, sexual ambiguity Absolutely. and uh, lack, of clarity. lack of clarity. And yes. uh, he was looking for setting up a socially acceptable home with uh, Gussie. Gussie, yes. And yet Augusta. he had, yes, yes, yet he had a very warm and cordial, understandable uh, companionship with uh, Lushington, Lushington yes. which didn't come to uh, yes. anything. Yes. And at 62, he was a very lonely man. Absolutely. So uh, that I thought, uh, if you Thank could you comment that. upon. Because that yeah. was the most difficult thing. Yes, to... I was imagining that would have been difficult, difficult in the 19th, difficult century. In the 19th century. Yes. So and also for me to write, without providing any categorical explanation True. for his sexuality. I had to place him in that uneven ground where he's vacillating, groping in a way. Yes. Also with raised expectations of more than friendship and also wanting to establish a relationship with a woman so that there would be a certain degree of respectability, mm -hmm. right? A home to live in. And I dramatized that throughout. And yes. that is something that a lot of my friends uh, uh, in the US found uh, very powerful about this book. As a matter of fact, more than anything else, I think they had a, yes. a real understanding of the kind of, you know, the, the movements of that, of that sensibility. And at that time, it that time. wouldn't have been You anything. can't get away from the fact yes. that, yeah. you know, you're a foster scholar, so you will know yeah. uh, the <laughs> yeah, ambiguity exactly. and the, the yeah, power of this it. I've written um, about it. Yeah, in yeah. sexual preference. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, Anissa. Thank you. Uh, Professor Choitali Moitro, would you like to come and say a few quick words? Come, come, come. Congratulations, Professor Roy. I was just uh, curious to know that uh, throughout the 19th century over, you find this uh, element of suffering, which does become sort of quite capital in the life of uh, Edward Lear. The same about uh, Louis Carroll, partly true about Charles Lamb, certainly true for Dickens, not that all of them managed nonsense world, although, although Louis Carroll did. How would you pitch this suffering in the 19th century context, please? It's obviously a historical explanation for it. Uh, you know, this was also the time of what you might call a certain belief in uh, the aspiration, the individual aspiration, the aspirational ethos that comes with capitalism. Um, but there were also lots of boundaries and pressures placed on people to be able to regulate themselves. If you have read Michel Foucault, you know how that works, right? How you learn to regulate yourself. And the regulation inevitably leads to little pressure points where things kind of come out, spill out. But you're not fully able to articulate it. Just maybe gesture towards it a little bit. But that's about it. Uh, Christina Rossetti, same thing. Uh, with Edward Lear, I felt that uh, here was a man who traveled so much, loved his food, right? Uh, loved to travel, made many friends. You would think, oh, well, you know, uh, why was he killing himself in a way, thinking about his loneliness and his lack of home? Because in many ways, I think what he saw or all around him was a kind of a settled aspirational ethos. People achieve a certain thing and go beyond it, whether it's stability of marriage or a household or children. And he had none of that. All he had was a lot of affection for children, but they were all directed at his friend's children, right? And, and, and he wrote most of his limericks for them, interesting mm. enough. He and never had any. Yes. It's probably the same thing in the postmodern context. Yes. That we hide behind, you know, whether it's social media, whether it's gizmos, whether it's video games, not being able to find that sucker and that kind of bond that you would want yeah. in a family yeah. of your own. I think that's, you really yeah. feel the pathos. Yeah, you do. So, uh, Arish, Dr. Mehta, would you like to? Congratulate you on your uh, novel. 
And uh, I have no question as such, but just a, an observation when you might want to respond to. And that is that uh, on reading, I've only read the first cha chapter yet, and that uh, it struck me as, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to place it somewhere, you know, what am I reading? And I thought I was reading uh, Raj literature. Hmm. And then when you went into the details of, uh, you know, juxtaposition of uh, an imperial person with a domestic staff, I, I thought of uh, Somerset Maugham, yeah. Far Eastern yeah. Tales. Far East. And then, you know, I, I haven't no. gone deep into the book to discover if there is racism or if there is, uh, you know, regular thrashings of the white, yeah. by the white man of the other, you know, no, no, which, which George Orwell. Yeah, no, no we don't get that. In no. Yeah. You know, the, the, the club yeah. where they would. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. The Burmese. Yeah. yeah. I, I so, can't say it in no, a club, no. what, what used to go on. Yeah. A lot of violence in George Orwell. Definitely. Right. So, uh, so this is how I see it, and I, th I just think that the book uh, will find its way in the world as, you know, because of your greatly uh, nuanced understandings of the hills and the hill peoples and their foods, that it will sort of find its place amongst, because it's after all a Raj Delhi. Yeah, it is. And, and, th and that's what yeah, I thought. It is. Uh, thank you very much. But you're certainly right in pointing out that it's my, you know, uh, inhabiting that world and getting a sense of that world, learning to the language a little bit, communicating through gestures, walking, feeling the exhaustion of walking, you know, breathing in the mountain air, suddenly seeing the mountains appear, uh, the mists, and also sharing it with students from Kobe, with many of my students who are also the first time you know, in India, uh, they shared some of that. And Yael was uh, one of the speakers at, uh, I think years ago in 2017 or so. And they shared that with her as well. I think sharing it with a larger group allows you to see things from a multifaceted perspective, as opposed to be a singular vision of me doing this scene. It's seeing in a relational way that really makes narrative work for me. Excellent. Uh, anyone else from the floor? Yael, would you like to say a few words? Come, please. Come. <laughs> the floor is open, ladies and gentlemen. If you'd like to make a point about, I know most of you may not have read the book yet, but it'll spur you on to read it. No? Come on. It's still yeah, tell us about your experience in Kalimpong. At least that you could, even if you have to. <laughs> I was part of a jam plan with other students um, learning about the area and the region, which is what the jam plan is all about. At that time, this was not even a twinkle in Anindo's eyes. Okay, he had no idea that was on. But I have had the opportunity because Anindo has a home there in Kedong. And many people here know that home much better than I do, his family members, for example. And so I have also been able to understand that region much better through Anindo. But um, I love the book, Anindo. I love the way Anindo writes. And um, I especially love the struggle of the painter throughout, where he really couldn't go beyond that middle ground to because you Because you yourself. Are a painter. Yeah. You're a so, painter. Yeah. So I really love that struggle to it. But one thing that didn't come out in this uh, telling was all the interactions with children throughout his stay and his entertaining of children through the book and how they saw and found him a very loved character and how he was so gentle with them and playful with the children as well. So I thought that was something I really enjoyed about the book too, which we haven't discussed. Thank you, Yael. Anybody else from this floor? Or shall we go to our virtual? Is through one of those uh, memory flashes. Um, he's thinking of being in England with 
Lord Darby's children as they are putting on a show based on his limericks. <laughs> Basically, someone dresses up as the Lady of Dorkin and struts out. But I think the chapter two is uh, chapter four, five. While I was reading the journals, um, I was struck by one line that appeared in the journals and it said, I spent the morning with the, with the young daughter, the seven-year-old daughter of Curtis and her Indian friend. That's all he says in his journal. And then he goes on to say that we had a wonderful time composing and reciting limericks. Now, as a fiction writer, I said, how can I turn this into a scene? So I had to create those two girls, the English girl, or she's English, or maybe Eurasian, we don't know exactly who Curtis was, uh, and her Indian friend, Manju, right? And what I do is I have him reading uh, from his limericks, uh, and, and the children, like putting on a show, literally, enacting some of it, but also composing their own poems. And then they start drawing, and then he helps them draw. And they draw upon, and also because Manju is Indian, she uses a lot of Indian words. Because I was wondering, how was Lear able to incorporate so many so-called Indian words into his nonsense? He was listening very carefully, of course. He was listening to the chatter on platforms, railway platforms. But I figured, why not use this scene to kind of prepare him to write something like the Kamarban uh, through an interaction with an Indian child. So that's the scene. And in another section, he composes a nonsense story for two English children. And that story, of course, is like a light allegory of empire in a way, you know, without making it too obvious. Uh, but it's a funny story. That's what it is. So to answer that question. Wonderful. Thank Wonderful. You. Anandhi, do you want to uh, ask? Okay. As soon as you speak, yes. I'll, I'll turn a little bit. Is there a question from my interlocutors from other parts of the world. There's Ratna Raman. Is there any way they can signal that they want to say something? Participants can unmute themselves and they can switch on the camera. Participants can unmute themselves. Okay. Yeah. I've unmuted myself. I really enjoyed listening to this session. And uh, I'm just beginning to think while listening to all of you. Uh, one second. I'm just beginning yeah, to there think. she is. There she is. My friend yeah. Ratna Raman from Delhi. Hi. Hi. So I'm just beginning to think that this is such a fascinating period. And uh, I mean, I'm really looking forward to your session in Delhi now. <laughs> <laughs> You'd pretty much hear the same thing with variations here yes. and there, a few modulations maybe, depending of course on your questions. Absolutely. There are other things that you can address. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, so a small thing that I would like to add because uh, you've been introduced by Julie as uh, Professor Emeritus. I just wanted to say, Julie, the first time I met Anindu, he was not a professor. We sat on the steps of the university special for weeks <laughs> on end. He was in his master's and I was in the third year of my uh, undergraduate years. And we discussed literature in a speeding Delhi bus. I don't think it can ever be done again. So, oh, you know, yeah. it, it, well, it's quite, it's quite clear that your Delhi university stamp is right there. <laughs> yeah. And during winter, we used to sit on the steps of the bus and talk about literature and feel the cold, icy wind, you know, <laughs> rush through. Our That's something I remember very well. And we did it almost every day. 
it was easier to take the morning morning special because then you would save time right commuting to the university yeah so ratna has been a friend for many many years and she writes she used to write frequently for uh, what's the name of the newspaper the tribune the no, tribune but, uh, columns she's yeah. got a book on doris lessing by the way a full length study of doris lessing and she's professor yeah. at venkateshwara college um okay but i just wanted to say that i just realized while listening to all these other characters that uh, i mean i mean sorry listening to all these other conversations and all these other characters that you threw up in the course of the conversation that there is really no period in history like the 19th century it is such an extraordinary space it and, is uh, it is you know <laughs> given the binaries of gender at that point i'm deeply grateful i didn't have to fight for the vote i didn't have to fight for work in the public space but what an incredibly fascinating space in which people were finding themselves chasing their passion articulating the you know relevance of a world that you know was a difficult place but one that they were beginning to discover and knew it's just an extraordinary period <laughs> colonialism warts and all racism yeah. And yeah, I think it's it's e easy to also over romanticize the struggle because the, the struggles produced this the fascinating Absolutely. 19th Absolutely. century the narratives because if there were not people fighting against the boundaries, you would not have the narratives. Yeah. But to also understand that there were real struggles, there was a Absolutely. lot of hardship that people went through. Yeah, so so many of the things that we take for granted now, they were formulated as problematic. Absolutely, in the 19th century, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Ratna. Thank you so much. It's good. It, it, it was a very sharp point to make. Yes, and, and, the 19th century facts. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you. Yeah. So, is there anyone else who, who I see would like to engage with the author? Oh, who are the others? Was it Antonio from Italy, my friend from Italy? <laughs> if they if they just if yeah they begin to put the video on and talk, they should be they should be able to see the thumbnail. Yes, if you just turn on in your video, we will be able to see you, and then we can prompt you. Is there anyone else out there? Oh, yes, that's Antonia. Hello, Antonia. Oh, Mike, your mic is mute. Is Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Oh, good evening. Uh, good evening to everybody. It was wonderful to be with you from Italy. Um, you know, for, for those who don't know me, we are good friends. And yeah, so it was like being home again. Uh, and the British Indu Library, friends. <laughs> thank yeah. you, Anindu, for your work. Um, it sounds absolutely fascinating. I have to confess, I haven't had the time read to read it, but uh, it won't be long. Uh, can I ask you, I don't know, maybe it's somebody who has already asked you the same question, but I couldn't hear you at the beginning. How did mm. the first idea pop into your mind? Because someone suggested uh, that I well, should write. <laughs> uh, because well, I had a document and I didn't know what to do with the document. I was clearly fascinated with it in a way, intrigued by it, but I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew I didn't want to write yet another scholarly piece about the middle ground. Uh, and then uh, a person who wrote fiction said, hey, this story is uh, ideally suited for retelling. So why don't you write his? And I said, you must be kidding. As I, I told the audience, one writes about fiction as a scholar, but not fiction itself. Uh, and then things came together. There was something about that lockdown, I think, 
the 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 you know the total suspension of movement the stillness uh you're all alone and all of a sudden these things become real to you they surge through you and then if you have the energy you start writing and i did have the energy i don't know where it came from i would get up in the morning and even before i would have breakfast i would start writing i and it i wrote and wrote and wrote that's it and i nourished myself with a lot of yogurt rice and tomato rice for those three months when there was no one to do any cooking and i wrote so that was my nourishment in a way i think writing provided the nourishment thank you for something that good came out of covid thank you very much for answering and thank you everybody thank you thank, thank you, you antonia bye-bye so uh, you know like all wonderful things Thank you, Anindyo. I think uh, I would like to call on Professor Moitro. If you would like to give us a little vote of thanks, that would be marvelous for Anindyo. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So we all have been having a very, very enthralling evening. Uh, done by Julie D and Professor Roy. And I feel that most of us who know the book would agree that it's a book about real and imagined presences. So as we are about to close this session, uh, it's my privilege uh, on the part of the Bengal Club to thank Professor Roy for reconstructing and resurrecting a very, very strong and absorbing narrative in which we all have almost sort of come as close as possible to the honey, money, the runcible spoon, and the dance with the moon. Thanks to Julie D, without whose efforts such an evening would never have happened. And thanks to the wonderful audience for showing up, for being here in this chilly Kolkata evening, which is rather a rarity compared to the other 10 months we endure. Thank you all. And now it's time for me to call my friend Anasua to hand over the bouquet to the star of this evening with a small gift. Another one to end the evening for our dear Julie Dee. A second to offer my flowers to Mrs. Flower Cinnamon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye and good night.